as I said, we have another short lecture to get through. This is to keep most of the time on the cases because I know there's a lot of work that needs to be done to complete those cases before the semester is over. So this will be kept as short as possible. This week is all about the max. Uh, feel free to research the old days of Mac from the Apple One through their transformation to Mac OS X. Uh, if you're dealing with Macs, then it is important to understand the, the lifestyle, the, the vices, the history, and all that that goes with the Mac. The Mac file system uh, was brought in in, in 84. It has been replaced by HFS when Mac OS X was updated with Unix. Uh, since then, Macs are able to read NTFS, FAT, and X file system. Uh, the HFS hierarchical file system has two parts. The data fork, which consisted of the data and the resource fork, which is stored uh, the fundamental file metadata and associated application data similar to NTFS's alternate data stream. Uh, HFS is case sensitive. It has been around since 98. Uh, it has an allocation block number, a 32-bit number that identifies an allocation block. There's a volume header that has information about the volume, time and date of its creation, a number of files stored. The alternate volume header is a copy of the first and is stored in the last 1,024 bytes of the volume. The catalog file contains metadata structured as a B tree. The catalog ID is a unique sequential number that is created with a new file. It is deleted at file deletion, but the number is never repeated. APFS, Apple File System, is a 64-bit file system. Timestamps are stored in nanoseconds. APFS uses copy on write when data is duplicated with a container regardless of the volume. The data content is not replicated and only metadata is duplicated. This means that two files will have data content that is physically stored in the same blocks. APFS does have strong encryption, which includes full disk encryption with single or multi-key encryption. Depending on the hardware, APFS will use AES XTS or AES CBC encryption. Key bags store the encryption information, including the keys to unlock a container. The container key bag holds the volume key bags and the volume encryption key, a file system key used to encrypt data blocks. Those same key bags can also hold key encryption key that are derived from each user's password on a system and the recovery key. The key encryption key is critical in decrypting a volume. An examiner needs one user's password or recovery key to open the volume key bag or VEK. Beginning in 2017, Mac devices have a T2 security chip, which has efficable storage for some encryption information and has a cryptographic engine to conduct hardware enabled operations. These are inaccessible keys that are stored on the chip, which requires interfacing with the chip in order to acquire decrypted information, which means uh, 
chip write off uh, will, is much harder. There's also space sharing, which allows multiple file systems to share the same underlying free space on a physical volume. APFS volumes, also called containers, can grow and shrink without repartitioning. A container is compromised of a series of logical APFS volumes, which share blocks from the container. Physical disks combine to form an APFS container. To do some forensic examinations on a Mac, you can always start with Spotlight, containing a treasure trove of evidence, including file and application metadata. Files that are removed to the trash and then deleted cannot be recovered as the OS no longer maintains a link to reference that file's physical location or the catalog ID no longer exists. The .ds store file will contain an indication of the files that were moved to the trash. Journaling in HFS Plus is a feature that maintains a backup of user files so that if a system crashes, the last saved copy of that file can be made available to the user. DNG images are an exact copy of a file or a volume, and all the files within can be encrypted. A DMG file in Mac is the equivalent of a DD image and can be viewed as a mountable virtual disk. Uh, another note on the DMG is a sparse image is a virtual file for Mac OS that will grow in size as more files are added. Sparse bundle is like sparse image, but is used within File Vault. PList or property list format files are configurable files or configuration files similar to registry found in Windows. PList will contain a wealth of information for investigators. Here's a picture from an older Mac, uh, like user and application preferences. There is also the .sleep image file that has a content that has the content from RAM. If power goes out, this file is read and moved back into active memory. It does look like an older version of Mac, but it's still, uh, PLIS are still around. From the classic Mac OS in 84 with a GUI and a mouse through all the way to today, having a knowledge of the history and version numbers is important for the specific work, such as knowing that Puma was 10.1 and released September 2001 or Catalina 10.15 was released in October 2019. For this section, as it was written in the book when Catalina was out, that will be uh, the focus. There is a feature called Gatekeeper that enforces code signing for downloaded apps before executing. Mac OS verifies the developer ID signature to check that the program comes from a recognized developer. There's File Vault. When enabled, there's virtually no helpful evidence that can be retrieved. There is a recovery key that the user is encouraged to save or print. There's also the option to save it with Apple making contact to Apple worth a try. There's Disk Utility, a tool to conduct disk functions like verifying, repairing, formatting, mounting, and can be accessed through the terminal as disk util. There is the keychain. Uh, it stores passwords in 256-bit AES. It can include other information like a user's credit card. There are tags in the finder 
that can demonstrate personalization and organization of files by a suspect. Safari has a number of files, like the history plist, downloads plist, cache database, and so on. Similarly to, to Mac OS, yes, Keychain also stores saved Wi-Fi networks. Uh, similarly to Mac OS, knowledge of the mobile device world and the various nuances of these products is important. For example, mobile devices can be more beneficial as there's more evidence and more personalized data in mobile devices. They are often interconnected in an Apple environment, meaning the same device can be, or the same information, same evidence can be retrieved from multiple devices. Because of the similarities, there is more predictability about what to expect when investigating these devices. Since Apple is in control of the ecosystem, it can be possible to request user data and assistance from Apple. But of course, it's not without its challenges as Apple encourages users to upgrade to the latest version of iOS, which tends to have significant improvements to security, creating more problems for law enforcement retrieving evidence from a device. Now, iOS is formatted in APFS and is divided into the root partition and media partition. iOS is encrypted in AES-256 at the block level. There is a unique device identifier, a 40 digit alphanumeric identifier for each device hard coded into the application processor along with the group identifier. Apple doesn't keep a record of this, but it's used to cryptographically link data to a specific device rendering chip off worthless. Uh, data protection allows the user to receive phone calls text messages and emails while the device is locked and, uh, and not decrypting sensitive information. Each time a file is created, data protection generates a new 256-bit key for the file and is sent to the AES engine, which is enabled automatically when a passcode is set. USB restricted mode prevents a trusted computer from unlocking iOS forcing the user to re-enter the passcode. Every app is encrypted with AES-256 by default. The data with these apps is also encrypted with the passcode, causing a nightmare for investigators if they don't have the passcode. Many users no longer sync their devices with the computer eliminating the potential to unlock a device using a pairing file. There are various modes of operation from DFW mode to recovery. Uh, there's a process of how it boots up. Uh, face and touch ID, again, it's legally possible for law enforcement to force a suspect to unlock their device via biometrics. Though both information is stored in the secure enclave, it is still legal for law enforcement to force a suspect to use their fingers to unlock or use face ID. Photographs have geotagging on, so it's possible to pot where a suspect or victim was. Uh, location forensic data can be retrieved from the list of possible places. It is possible to use the SSIDs that were recorded and plot them with wiggle.net to map out where the victim or the suspect was. Checkmate and check rain are two exploits against the boot ROM which cannot be remotely patched by Apple. It makes a full file system extraction on iPhones and does constitute jailbreaking. Check Rain can do a full system extraction when the password is known or a partial file system extraction when it is unknown. 
So again, understanding the type of Mac that will be examined is useful. Each model has different ports and will determine the options that you have available to image the device and whether the hard drive can easily be removed. Of course, with later versions, you have the, these various components all together. Or even with like the new M1, RAM is part of the system on a chip. So you can't really image memory separately. Determining the OS will provide some guidance as to what security features the examiner may encounter. The hardware and software running on the computer will also impact the investigator, like T2 chipset with secure boot, or a file vault enabled or APFS. Um, Apple does have a check coverage site where investigators can enter a serial number and determine this, the technical specs of a device. Encryption is really the biggest hurdle that law enforcement has with Mac devices. Ultimately, you want to obtain a DMG image of the Mac hard drive and then mount it with read-only forensic tools in order to perform your analysis. Not being able to do that will just be one big nightmare dealing with Mac. Any questions? Okay, seeing none. Uh, as, as we said, we're continuing to work on the final exam, which is a variety of case files. Ask away if you have any questions on Discord. Uh, but there is no other work besides the review quizzes for each module. Everything is due on the due until date. This is week 12, so you have about three or four more weeks to get everything done. I highly, highly suggest making some calendar reminder as you get closer to the due until date, because once that day and time is uh, is reached, nothing will be accepted. There will be no excuses. There will be no leniency. When that date is reached, nothing will be accepted. And I will just grade whatever you have and your grade is what it is. Please remember that any zeros I have given you from the beginning of the course until now can be changed. The zeros are not permanent. As long as you submit something, I will grade it and give you points. But once we reach that due until date, that is a very hard stop. Not trying to be mean, but just reminding you of the class policy that you can submit something late. You could submit something from week one if you forgot and you will receive no penalty but once we hit that due until date and time, nothing will be accepted. Uh, the next grading period, I'm gonna try to do grading um, more frequently as we get closer, because students start submitting more, more stuff as we get closer to the end. Um, you can always ask me to grade and, and you know, I'll carve some time to do it. But I will I will typically announce on Discord like the morning of or the day before. So you're aware of when I'm gonna do my next round of grading. <laughs>